We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall. Welcome to The Meaningful Life. At the heart of this podcast are three questions. Who am I? What are my values rather than my parents, my teachers, and the wider community? And what makes my life meaningful? For all of these questions, I think we can agree you will need wisdom. My witness is Delipe Geste, MD, who is the Senior Associate Dean for Healthy Aging and Senior Care and the Distinguished Professor of Psychiatry and Neurosciences at UC University in San Diego, USA. He's also the author of a new book called Wiser, The Scientific Roots of Wisdom, Compassion and What Makes Us Good. So, Delipe, what in your upbringing led you to be interested in wisdom, do you think? So, first of all, Andrew, thank you for having me on your podcast. It's a pleasure to meet with you. I grew up uh, in India, and like most Eastern cultures, it is believed that older people are wiser, older people are respected. And also, the Indian scripture called the Gita, which is kind of the Indian Bible, if you would, it is believed to be a compendium of wisdom in everyday life. So I grew up thinking that wisdom is a real thing and that wisdom increases with aging. And I took it for granted that this must be the truth, obviously. And it's only decades later, after uh, I became a neuroscientist and a geriatric psychiatrist, I began wondering whether those are just beliefs or there is some science. Is there such a thing as wisdom? Can you measure it? Does it have biology? And does it really increase with age? So although this concept has been behind my thinking for a long time, the scientific study we started only about 15 years ago or so. And did you find a big difference in the attitudes to ageing and wisdom when you came to America in contrast with India? Definitely. Big difference. One is that uh, in the US, and I think probably that applies to most uh, Western cultures, older people are thought to be a burden on the society. Ageism is very pervasive. You know, we all know that the number of older people in the world is increasing very rapidly. There will be more older people than children very soon. So the whole demography is changing. And yet, people describe it as a silver tsunami, as if it's a disaster that is happening to us, that is older people's wave is coming and it is going to ruin the world. Why? Because of the economy. They think that older people cost a lot of money, which is true. The healthcare in older age does cost more money and that older people may not be as physically healthy and functioning well as younger people. And so this concept is that older people are a burden on the society and anything we do for them, we are taking resources away from the children and young people in whom we should invest. And I found that that's actually wrong and not wrong for ethical reasons or moral reasons. It's wrong because it is factually wrong. Similar thing about wisdom. When I first actually mentioned the idea of doing research on wisdom 15 years ago, several of my colleagues and friends, they said, you know, do anything, but don't say you're doing research on wisdom. Nobody will take you seriously. Wisdom is a religious and philosophical concept. It's not a scientific concept. And I took that as a challenge. And I said, let us find out. I mean, there has been some scientific study of wisdom starting in 1970s in the Max Planck Institute in Berlin and uh, also at University of Southern California. But typically, 
the medical side, the physicians or the healthcare professionals or neuroscientists have not been involved in studies of wisdom. So it is being done mainly by gerontologists, sociologists, psychologists. And I'm a physician, I'm a psychiatrist, and I'm a neuroscientist. And I thought it is really important for us to get into this, to understand what it is and what it is not. So let's actually get down to brass tacks. What exactly is wisdom? Because if we're going to spend the next hour talking about it, I think we need to actually work out what it is we're talking about. No, I agree. Wisdom is a personality trait. Mm. It's a personality trait like resilience, optimism, neuroticism, extroversion, introversion, right? So it describes a characteristic pattern of behaviour in an individual. But it's different from passing exams, and that's not necessarily wisdom. Yes. So what's the difference between wisdom and intelligence? Correct. You're absolutely right. Wisdom is different from intelligence. Of course, some basic intelligence is needed for wisdom. I mean, if we are severely brain damaged, then person cannot be wise. But beyond that, there is no correlation between intelligence and wisdom. Some of the most intelligent people are some of the most unwise people and vice versa. So wisdom is a personality trait with specific components. And that's what distinguishes it from intelligence. The most important component is empathy and compassion. I will just list the components and then I I can talk about each of them in some detail. So first is empathy and compassion, the most important component. Then comes emotional regulation. Next is self-reflection. Then comes decisiveness, social advising, accepting uncertainty and diversity of perspectives. And the last one, which is controversial, is spirituality. We're going to break these down one by one, but I think we should lay our cards down on the table. What we're saying is that there are components to wisdom. You can actually become more wise by developing yourself in these five areas. And this is going to make your life, as far as I'm concerned, more meaningful and, in that case, a better life. So this is really key stuff. And, I mean, what I loved about your book is this is the first time I've ever actually thought or been asked to think, actually, what makes up wisdom? Because if you'd asked me beforehand, I would have sort of read improving books, basically. And that might help me, but these are actually things that I can actually use in a very practical way. So let's look at, with each case, what the factor is, and then how we might develop it and why it's important. So the first one you mentioned was compassion. So let's break down compassion. Sure. So compassion has within itself two components. One is empathy and one is compassion. Empathy means understanding and sharing somebody else's emotions or thoughts. Compassion means acting on it and helping the other person. Okay. So empathy means I see somebody who is, say, sad and hurting then I can see that the person is sad and I feel sad for that person. So that is empathy. And then I go out and help that person. That is compassion. And why should that be important for wisdom? Because wisdom has a purpose. The purpose of wisdom is to increase the well-being of each of us individually, but also of the society as a whole. And that's what is unique about wisdom, that I do think that wisdom has evolutionary value. We humans need wisdom to survive, let alone thrive. Actually, the word for humans is homo sapiens. And homo sapiens literally means wise man. So wisdom is, compassion is critical for us to work with one another, to help one another. We need that for the survival of human species. So how can we increase our compassion and in that way increase our wisdom? So there are some specific ways uh, that uh, we suggest for improving compassion in our book. The first is keeping a gratitude diary or three good things. At the end of the day, before going to bed, 
write three things that made you feel grateful because somebody helped you or that made you feel proud because you helped somebody. And you don't need necessarily to write those things. You can talk about them to somebody and that's okay. But make it a habit. Make it your second nature about thinking about three things that made you feel both proud and grateful. And if you do that regularly, then we will get up the next morning and thinking about what am I going to do today that I will have something to put in my diary or tell somebody. So that's the important thing, that it should become our second nature and not just practicing once in a while. And I think you actually notice it. I did this for about a year. I only did one thing every time I wrote in my diary, which was possibly four times a week or something like that. And I would finish every entry with something that I was grateful for. I'm afraid to say I stopped after a while, but it did actually make me feel more connected to the world, I think would be the way I would put it. That's exactly right. That it makes us feel connected to the world in a positive sense. And where we feel happy that others are helping us, we feel proud that we are helping others. So it's a positive social connection, which is really essential for human survival and thriving. The second thing is volunteering. Let us spend a few hours a week doing things that are not a part of our job, but that we want to do to help somebody else. Uh, For example, you can volunteer in a nursing home helping people with dementia or work in a foster care home or a place where children with autism spectrum disorder are there or people, other disabilities. When we do that, it really obviously helps those people but it makes us feel very proud of ourselves. And it is something we can brag about, we should brag about, because then that becomes a role model for others. So volunteering is really important. And the third one is we should regularly spend some time with people who are different from us. Ah, that's a a really interesting idea. Yes, different in the color of our skin difference in different in our beliefs, whether it is religious belief, social belief, political belief, whatever it is. I think different ages as well. I think it's we can very easily get into a sort of a, a system where all of our friends are a similar age at a similar stage in life. And actually, you know, I have a friend who's 95 or something like that. And it really does give you a different kind of perspective on the world. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I'm glad you mentioned that because intergenerational activities are important for wisdom. That older people should interact with younger people and vice versa because they bring different things to the table. So we have done some studies in which we had this interaction between younger and older people. And what we found was that that made the older people feel very good because they were giving something, they were learning something from younger ones, and they were role models for calmness and wisdom for the younger ones. The younger ones brought enthusiasm, energy, ability to learn new things. And so it really was a very mutually beneficial interaction. So the first thing we have is compassion. The second thing you have is something that I spend all day, every day, trying to help people with. I mean, it is really one of the cornerstones of a good life, and that is emotional regulation. So tell me about emotional regulation and why it's important for wisdom. Yes. It is really important to control our emotions in order to think and act logically. Uh, When the emotions take over, we get upset. We can maybe get angry, depressed, sad, anxious, panicky, When that happens, it really controls our actions. And then we do something that we should never have done. We wouldn't do that ourselves if we had control. So the one example I give, I live in California. So road rage is a common thing. (laughs) Road rage. Yes. Yep. I'm driving, you know, in the morning, I'm going to work. I'm already a little late. And then somebody cuts in front of me. I'm so mad that I start (laughs) honking, cursing, and so on, delegating. And that's not going to help me. There's a risk, actually, that I may run into an accident. So how do you control that? The first thing you do is rethink about why that person cut in front of you. 
we think he cut in front of you because he's a jerk and he just wanted to be, he was a narcissistic person etc but it could be that that person was driving with a child on the back seat and the child suddenly had a seizure or the child threw up what would you do if you were in his shoes you would do the same thing cut in front of others to go to the hospital emergency room or something like that and that may not be the case but you don't know why he or she cut in front of you so you can give the person benefit of doubt thinking that it was not personally directed toward you but there were some important needs for that person to meet and that's why he cut in front of you which actually calms you down tremendously because the emotional upset comes because you feel personally insulted and that's not the case actually the person actually had something else in mind and needed to do that so that's one thing second is distraction which is if you are listening to music on the radio at that time just increase the volume so <laughs> forget about everything else and look at that sing along <laughs> yes or if they are listening to your podcast and can pay right attention to the podcast and the third is then set a mindfulness accept the fact that you were mad you are mad and that's logical if somebody cut in front of you you are upset that's okay but this has happened to you before you got out of it and same thing will happen now so just it is gone so that we have been there we have done that and let us move on so let's not stop thinking because it becomes very stressful that anger that we carry is not good for our own health and what i find in relationships because that's my key work is that when we get flooded because it's okay to be emotional because it's necessary to be emotional and to listen to our emotions but we don't want to be what i would call flooded is we sort of expect other people to deflood us either you know we start going and we sort of expect our partner to calm us down or to accept our upset and in that way calm us down but we've actually lost control of our not lost control but by giving somebody else the responsibility you are no longer in charge of yourself and expecting other people to regulate you rather than self regulate is a sort of um, a recipe for a, an unhappy life but unfortunately we live in this world that says if you love somebody then they're going to sort you out and turning them into your emotional regulator is not really in the job description of a partner so you end up in a, a sort of a self-defeating argument with your partner and i don't think there's much wisdom to be got there so thank you for that the next thing you've put down is self-reflection and in your book you put in curiosity and humor in there as well so tell me about that group of attributes Sure. So self-reflection actually means looking inside, looking at our own behavior, trying to understand what we did, why we did it. You know, when something goes wrong, the knee-jerk reaction is to blame something or somebody else. This happened to me because you did something, or he or she did something. Instead of that, thinking that maybe I did something that was wrong. and let me just think about that let me not come to a conclusion very rapidly i need some time to think about it and it is really important to do that regularly now people often when they self reflect the self reflection is biased in the sense it starts out with thinking that i am right other person is wrong and then you try to find justification for that mm-hmm. that's not the self reflection one means here that's called passing the buck isn't it <laughs> exactly that's exactly right passing the bug and what is the problem with the passing the bug is actually it hurts you in the longer run because you are not learning from what went wrong so if you learn from what went wrong you would do better job next time it will make you happier so even from a selfish perspective of your own well being we need honest self reflection how do we stop that sort of um, tipping over into sort of honest self destruction right so again it needs to be made uh, a habit it should be a second nature so what we should do we should set aside some time regularly for self reflection you know we most of us set aside time for physical exercise right i mean we go people go for a walk they may go to the gym treadmill whatever etc right? and most people i think these days are health conscious and do something along that line 
why don't we set aside time for wisdom exercise? So what do you do for a wisdom exercise then, Dilipe? Self-reflection is the critical part of that. In the sense, think about what happened in the last two, three days. So let's say we set aside half an hour three times a week. Then in that half hour, you think about what things happened over the last couple of days, things that made you feel very stressed out, and also things that made you feel very happy about yourself. And if you do that regularly, you'll find a certain kind of pattern emerges that we get upset when somebody criticizes us in front of others, let's say, because it becomes humiliation, not just, right? Or we get uh, upset when we are in a party. We don't know what to do. And we feel we come out of that and we feel that we did a terrible job. Whatever it is, try to find out the common factors that lead to your feeling stressed out. And likewise, common factors that made you feel proud. That you went and helped somebody. Or you gave a good talk. Or you made a new person and established relationship. Or you read a book. Whatever it is. Find out that makes you feel happy. And this needs to be done in a very honest fashion. You're not cheating anybody else because it is stupid to cheat yourself, right? So think about things that made you feel happy, things that made you feel stressed out and try to understand yourself then that what is it that is driving it? The goal is to self-correction, self-improvement. So the reason for self-reflection is to self-improvement. And we find out that there is something that is really continues to bother us That is how we can change it. Instead of blaming that on the environment, then we can see, we can talk to other people how to change it, read about it, whatever it is. But self-reflection is really critical. And that's a kind of wisdom exercise. I would recommend journaling for that. And I have an article about how to journal and the benefits of journaling. And in the show notes, we'll connect to that. So then we've got balancing decisiveness and the acceptance of uncertainty. I'm not really quite certain what you mean by that, so you'll have to help me out. Sure. So uncertainty, accepting uncertainty is important. Sometimes we think that we know the answer and we are right. Nobody else uh, thinks otherwise is right. And so we are very certain about our views and our perspective and our actions. That's not correct because what seems certain may prove to be wrong the next day. We may be right one day, but could be wrong. That the same thing could turn out to be wrong the next day. So accepting uncertainty and also accepting diversity of perspectives. So I have some strong values and I accept them. Nothing wrong with that. But I can understand why somebody else may have different values. I don't have to agree with that person. I think today one big problem is this political polarization which is terrible. This is true in the US, UK, and actually in most countries in the world today. There is such severe political polarization that we don't just dislike other people. We hate them. And that kind of hatred is really bad for the society, bad for ourselves. It makes us stressed out. And it is unnecessary. Again, we don't have to give up our values. But we need to understand where the other person is coming from. Talk to them. And they need to know, of course, where you are coming from. You understand where they are coming from. And the conversation may end with no change in our beliefs. But at least you accept the fact that there can be other perspectives. And that doesn't mean that one of us is either evil or dumb. No, rational people can have differences of opinion. So that is accepting uncertainty and uh, diversity of perspectives. At the same time, we cannot be ambivalent about anything. We can't say, oh, I can't decide because this may be right, that may be right. We have to be decisive when time calls for it. So wisdom really requires that balance between accepting uncertainty and diversity of perspectives on one hand and being decisive on the other hand. Yes. And I'm just sitting here thinking we're probably in general In our society, and I'm talking again about American and uh, UK and Western society, we're much more towards the decisive end than the um, accepting uncertainty end. You know, we, we really admire people who can make decisions. And actually holding that ambivalence for a while is 
possibly sometimes seem almost as weak. How do we get the balance right? Absolutely right. I think this is a problem that people who are sort of considered moderates in the sense they have acceptance from both sides and they, so they're considered weak. And the more extreme your views, the more you're respected by some people and hated by others. But that means you make news. And that's what people are looking for, making news. And you make news by becoming an extremist rather than a moderate, balanced person. That's not really good for the society. I mean, clearly, we, we don't need to change our views, but we should have respect for other people's views, why they may have those views, and then have some logical discussion. Right now, there is no logical discussion in these cases. It is just very emotional discussion. And so, so that's what the hurts is. So I'm thinking more on a sort of family kind of level rather than a political level. So we need wisdom, I mean, particularly from parents, uh, teenagers. <laughs> teenagers are definitely on the uh, the decisive end. How do you get that balance right if you have teenagers? Clearly, it is uh, not easy. And often the parents have different perspectives on that. Teenagers know that. And they may try to split the parents by holding them to views which are opposite of each other. And then so one becomes a good parent, one becomes a bad parent, and that leads to then greater parental conflict. So what needs to happen in that case is for the parents to sit together, to think rationally, sort of, and again, just like we are talking about self-reflection, this is now self-reflection as it applies to a couple. I'm sort of thinking of a sort of almost like having starting something where you have a sort of like a, a family meeting. So you can actually say, well, you know, this is a really good point. We'll bring it to a family meeting on Friday night when we can all get together and talk about it. So there's a certain amount of decisiveness there in the sense that we're going to do something about it. But it doesn't have to be done this minute because most things beyond, you know, should we leave this house because it's burning down? We don't really have to decide straight away. We can wait till Friday or whatever day it is that you're going to have your family meeting. So that might be a good idea. Now, we're looking at the components of wisdom, and we can become wiser by trying to improve these elements. When I looked at these, I sort of nodded and went along quite happily. But this was the one where, you know, I'm really interested in spirituality. That's part of this podcast. But I wasn't quite certain how it would fit in with um, wisdom, because it could quite easily be just parroting other people's views that have been handed down through the generations rather than any particular wisdom. I mean, you're right. In a sense, spirituality, as I said at the beginning, it's a very controversial aspect of wisdom. Some people don't think it is a part of wisdom. Other people strongly think it is. So the first of all, spirituality is different from religiosity. So religiosity means belief in a very specific system of rituals, gods, and so on, and it can be spiritual. So it is different from religiosity, so that we have to understand. And spirituality is defined differently. Actually, I don't like the word spirituality. I wish we could have some other word for that, because I don't know what is spirit. And I think it is that word that really affects this concept. So what I mean by spirituality here is a feeling of connectedness, constant connectedness with something or someone that we don't see, hear, or perceive. Some people call it spirit. Some people call it soul, consciousness, or God. So it is really a system of belief that you have that other people don't see. But there is a kind of a trust and optimism that there is a rationale for whatever happens. When something goes wrong, you say, maybe there was some purpose why it went wrong because it made me feel better or made me do better next time. Something along that line. So you always interpret the things in a positive way. So that's what, to me, spirituality means. It is this constant connectedness with something or someone that we don't see in which you have considerable faith and belief. Somehow having something that is a sort of a higher power than you actually stops you being a sort of your own little god, so to speak. And if you're your own little god, then you know everything. And knowing everything and wisdom, I think, are probably a 
diametrically opposed. Actually, I would look at it uh, in a different way. This thing that there is something unknown that is there that makes one feel how small you are. That there is this huge world outside there, the huge universe out there. We don't even know what's going on, who that, whatever we believe in is. And that person or thing is responsible for some things. So you feel actually more uncertain and less confident and less narcissistic. Again, it, it depends on how one uses it. So I'm not questioning what you're saying at all. In the sense, I think that some people would take it negatively and then use that as their narcissism. But the way I mean it is more along the lines of connectedness with something positive that is always there. So you don't feel lonely. Even when you are alone, you don't feel lonely. I think social anomie is a big problem in today's society because of the moves, families have become smaller, we move. So if you have something or you know, of that kind that is constantly with you, they'll make you feel more secure, safe, and happier. So let's look at the link between ageing and wisdom you are making, because in your book, you sort of paraphrase Oscar Wilde and says, ageing and wisdom, one can come without the other, which is very true. And um, one of my favourite quotes is, the fool in King Lear Thou hadst not have been old till thou hadst been wise. Very good advice there. So they're not automatically linked, are they? So, so we have been studying wisdom, and as in a scientific way, we major wisdom, we developed a scale called San Diego Wisdom Scale, or uh, just the Thomas Wisdom Index. We have validated it, it's translated into multiple languages. Again, this, nothing is perfect, but at least there is one reasonable way of measuring wisdom. And we find that as people get older, some components of wisdom do increase. And if we think about ourselves beyond a certain age, think about ourselves when we were teenagers or in our 20s. And think about us today. Typically, most of us, not all, but most of us have become somewhat more empathic and compassionate toward others. We have more control over our emotions, unlike teenagers. Teenagers' emotions you know, fluctuate from hour to hour, minute to minute. We now have more control. We become more self-reflective. We don't always blame others. We think about what I could have done right. We feel less certain about our views. We are more accepting of our views than when we were teenagers or in our 20s. So there are scientific data that support that, that with aging, wisdom increases. Of course, there are two caveats. One caveat is not everybody becomes wiser with age. No. There are some older people who are very unwise and some young people who are very wise. So it is not a one-to-one relationship. And second, the wisdom increases with aging up to a certain point, though. That beyond that point, when the dementia sets in, for example, or you know, there is severe brain degeneration. We have lost some neurons and synapses and so on. The brain has shrunk. I mean, obviously, the wisdom cannot grow anymore. But other than those two caveats, I do think that normally aging is associated with wisdom, and that is important for our species. There is something called grandmother hypothesis of wisdom. So tell me about the grandmother hypothesis of wisdom, which is about why we're still here. You and I, which are both of us well past, um, <laughs> well past middle age. Yes. I'm, I'm perfectly happy to say I'm old. I don't know about you. Yeah. Well, yes and no. In the sense, I'm happy to say old, except that that refers to chronological age. Right. And chronological age doesn't mean too much. Because there are other ages that actually matter more. So biological age, for example, we don't know how to measure biological age, but biological age is different. Some 90-year-olds are physically healthier than some 30 and 40-year-olds, right? So the biological age is different. Cognitive age is something still different. Some people have better memory in their 80s than some people in their 40s, for example. Also, the most important, though, is the mental age or age of well-being, how happy do you feel? And actually happiness 
often increases with age, even when the physical health is declining. So, so, so to answer your question, I would say that I'm old. My only problem is in saying I'm old is that it sort of fits into the stereotypy of people saying that there's a chronology that matters. But if we don't say we're old, we end up with a society that thinks that, um, you know, you're 85 before you become old, which is just completely and utterly ludicrous. We can't all be middle-aged from 50 to 85. That's just ludicrous. You know, I agree with you to some extent. However, we have to realize that the life, average lifespan was 45 years in 1900. Today it is past 80, soon it will be 90. And so clearly the old age has changed that and part, for m- multiple reasons, including, you know, better uh, childhood care, these vaccines and food and so on and so forth. But a 45 year old in the old age used to be clearly old. Today, that's not coming. 65 year olds, you see, are functioning at a high level. So aging is a continuous process. There is no sort of fixed it is not that certainly on the 65th birthday, <laughs> you go on from being young to old. So, so it's really a continuous process rather than something arbitrarily divided. But coming back. Coming back to the grandmother hypothesis. Sure. So the grandmother hypothesis states that when the grandparents, especially the grandmother, is involved in helping their adult children raise kids, Says these adult children, they live longer, they are happier, and they are more fertile. They produce more children than the grandparents did. So, why is this important? Because we all know about Darwin's hypothesis of survival of the fittest. Darwin said that animals live only so long as they can contribute to the species' survival by producing babies. Because for each species, the old animals die and they have to be replaced with young ones. Otherwise, the species will be extinguished, right? So we are useful to the species only so long as we can produce babies. For humans, we stop producing babies around 45, 50. That's the age of menopause in women. And in men, there is something called andropause. Something similar happens. So the sex hormones, estrogens, testosterone, they begin going down. So we are not likely to produce children after the age of 50, most of us. So most of the animals in the wild, they die after they lose that fertility. Not humans. I mean, if our average lifespan will be 90, just think about that. Half of our lifespan will be spending without producing children, how does the nature allow that? That makes no sense. So older people must be doing something that compensates for the loss of fertility. So they don't produce children. They cannot produce children. However, if they help the younger generations live longer, be happier, and be more fertile, they have contributed to the species' survival. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. So we're doing something new this year on The Meaningful Life. In the past, you had to become a supporter to send in a letter for to be discussed by me and my guest. But now we're opening this up to everybody. So if you're listening and you have a dilemma that you would like some extra brains on, you can go to my website, www.andrewgmarshall forward slash podcasts. Let me give you that again, www.andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast. If you go right down to the very end, you'll see a feedback form and you can send a letter in that way. And the letter we have today, I have to confess, is a letter from me. So I'm going to take advantage of my own podcast to get some wisdom from Dalip on this one. My father died 10 days ago and I've been hit much harder than I expected. 
He was 91 in poor health and I've been preparing myself for this moment since my mother died five years ago. The best description I can come up with for how I feel is something is pressing in on me that I cannot name. When I try and break it down, I think there are several components. I don't live in my homeland anymore and my father's death breaks one of the strongest links. It has changed the geography of my family and I've lost a refuge. However bad things got, I knew I could always go home. It also brings back my old losses too. I have a loving husband, a great support network, an analyst. I'm a member of various therapeutical groups and I have loving friends. But I suppose my question comes down to this. How can I carry what cannot be fixed? So, what were your thoughts about this letter, Delipe? First of all, I should say, it is so beautifully written. Thank you. When I first read it, I was really touched and moved by it. It was very honest, thoughtful, emotional, without being too emotionally driven. I mean, it was very rational and yet very compassionate in a way to herself and to others. Also, I appreciated the fact that there are a lot of self-reflection that went in this letter that otherwise most other people would have said, oh, it is the loss of my father. But you said that you also realize that you're losing connection to your homeland. And the other losses came to the mind. And there's no place for a refuge as you thought you had. So I really think it's really beautifully written and conceptualized and real honest to the heart. And so I really appreciate that. Thank you. As I was thinking about wisdom, I think there are several components of wisdom that apply here. The first is, of course, self-reflection, and which is great. I mean, here, there is clearly a lot of self-reflection about several losses. One thing is that there is a feeling of being an orphan that comes when you lose your second parent. And it happened to me also. My mother died some years ago, and then my father died uh, a few years earlier, and I was in the U.S. Both of them were in India, and it really felt so sad that until now, I mean, I could always talk about my parents. They're there, and now I don't have parents. I mean, it, it just it, the, the feeling is very hard to accept. You feel lost, and you something you take for granted. So your parents. Uh, and again, the longer we live with the parents, the harder it becomes. You know, I mean, some unfortunate kids may lose their parents at a young age, but here, you know, after so many decades, so, so that's, that, that, that produces loneliness that is not correctable with other relationships. And it's not necessarily that physically we are in contact with our parents, but just at the back of the mind, it's always there. We take it for granted. How can they die? How can they leave us alone? So, so I think it is that thing. There's also, fear of one's own death, that now we are the oldest person in the family. Wow. I mean, our, always we had our And we had parents. our grandparents at one point as well. We had, we had quite a lot of cover, didn't we? Exactly. Exactly. And part of that is sort of some denial we have about our own death. But that denial ends here. Now we can see with your parents dying. So, so it's, I think, important to keep those things in mind what is happening. And of course, this is universal feeling. So there is something called sense of common humanity, that this is not only you experiencing this, almost everybody who goes through that will have experience of that to some extent. The second one, then empathy and compassion. Here, actually, I'm thinking compassion toward others, also compassion toward yourself. One thing I should mention in wisdom is when we talk about empathy, compassion, it is also compassion toward oneself is important. So here, it seems that there is some guilt feeling. Guilt about not having spent more time with the parents, with the father, or not visiting. I mean, I again, same thing here. So I'm describing myself in a way, not just you. Uh, and that uh, felt bad that I had not gone to India as often as I yep. should have, could have. And that I could have spent more time with my parents which I didn't. And again, there's no 
upper limit to that in the sense it doesn't matter how much time you spend. It's always you feel that you could have done more. Could I have written a letter in the last week just saying, you know, how much I allowed them and I didn't, because nobody knows exactly when the death is going to come. So there is a strong guilt feeling that we didn't do something which we should have, could have, would have. And that certainly it adds up because it ends with the death. There's nothing now you can do. When somebody gets very sick and, you know, when it's a terminal illness, they're in hospice care, still you can do something. You can go and every day you can say, how much I love you. When death, there's nothing you can do. So in Indian culture, there is belief in reincarnation. And I don't think it is scientific, but it actually provides some satisfaction. And do you see a big difference between how people would have responded to the death of your parents being an orphan in India in comparison with what actually happened when you were in America with that? I do think so. I think there is, again, you know, nothing is, I don't want to stereotype people because, they, you know, there are differences in, within people in the same culture. But yes, by and large, it would be easier to accept death in India than it is in the West. And why might that be? Part of the reason, I think in the West, we believe in our ability to do anything we want to, change anything we want to. So we believe in doing things. Whereas in India, Eastern culture, there's more fatalism that this is meant to be. That's why it happened. Here, we don't accept that. No, that, you know, it, it, we believe in agency, self-agency. We can do things, Nike, right? Take anything I can do. And death is something where all our agency and everything totally stops. Whereas if we are somewhat fatalistic, we accept that, then that makes you feel less bad about that. And also this reincarnation would make you feel that, okay, you know, I mean, it's too bad that I can't do anything, but maybe in my next birth, I'll be born and then I will do more, something along that line. So it's a question of, again, belief. And what do you think about this question, how can I carry what cannot be fixed? Because this is, this is the question I'm sort of, I'm thinking about very much at the moment. I'm not expecting to have it answered in, in the next uh, couple of minutes, but it's, it's something that I'm thinking about. And so I'm going to ask people I meet, you know, how they carry stuff that cannot be fixed, because that is the fundamental of life. We can't fix everything. Right. So that's where actually serenity prayer is for me the ultimate wisdom. So give us the serenity prayer. Serenity prayer, serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the thing that I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Mm. Once we accept that, then, you know, there is nothing we can do to think that already happened. But there are things I can do. So, for example, I can have a memorial in the name of my father. I can have some rituals where I will bring people in. And there are things I can do. What would he have wanted me to do? Or what would he have wanted the family to do? I think about that. I bring all my family together, his friends together, try to find out what he might have wanted. And then try to do those things. And then I feel happy, actually, that I'm doing something consciously. So if his soul is there, if we believe in that, then we can say that he would be feeling happy that I'm doing something for him. And in a sense, you're still in a relationship with him if you're doing things that are inspired by him. Exactly. Actually, regarding relationship, I love this sentence from Tuesdays with Mori. Probably you've seen that, read that book or beautiful. There, he says that, remember, that death is the end of life. It is not the end of a relationship. The relationship continues. And that's something worth keeping in mind that the physical relationship may have ended, but the psychological relationship will continue forever. Yeah, well, that is a, a beautiful thought. Thank you very much for that. So I've um, had you here as a witness on The Meaningful Life, so I have to turn the spotlight onto you and say, what makes your life meaningful? So I've been a researcher. I always was interested in learning something new. So I, what I find the meaning of life for me is learning and teaching. 
both go hand in hand. And I want to constantly learn something new. So I'm doing different kind of research today than I was doing 15 years ago. But I'm still, because that's something I can do better. I can't choose to be a musician because I have no music skills. But I'm doing something different than I did. So it is constantly evolving. That keeps my brain active, makes me happy, new relationships and so on. Uh, while I continue the old thing also. So it is not giving up something. But also that also in- increases intergenerational activities. Because when I'm teaching, these are the younger people who are there. I work with them. I learn something from them. So I feel blessed actually to have that. And that applies to my family also. So actually with my, again, children, grandchildren, etc. I'm learning from them. I'm teaching them something. And that's the real meaning of life for me is learning and teaching. And what are you learning in particular at the moment? So in terms of research, so there are different aspects of that. So actually just last week I had a session on microbiome and we talked about microbiome in relationship to wisdom. And we just completed a study, published it. And so I've been thinking about that, that how does gut microbiome affect the wisdom in the brain? And there is something called gut-brain axis. Again, so this is something new that I didn't know and I want to learn. And that makes it fun for me. Well, this is not where the conversation ends, because if you want to find out the three things that Dilip knows is true, and bearing in mind that... um, He's saying the older you get, the less you actually know. It's going to be fascinating to see if we've managed to pin him down on something. And uh, we're going to reflect on this conversation as well. If you want to hear all of that conversation, well, here are some details about how to continue listening. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Collick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.